Good morning, uh, or good afternoon, or whatever time zone you're in, insert appropriate time of day. Uh, my name is Peter Ashford. I'm a partner at Fox Williams and co-head of the International Arbitration Group. Uh, and this member event, we are discussing two cases that made it to the English uh, Supreme Court last year. Those cases are um, Enker and Chubb and Halliburton and Chubb, different Chubbs, um, but uh, the same name to compute at all. Uh, this event is being recorded um, and there is a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen uh, where you can um, ask any questions. Um, this is, as I said, a member event of, uh, for the LIDW. The LIDW is a collaborative, representative, world-class and forward-looking uh, body that demonstrates uh, UK's legal community's commitment to innovation, excellence, upholding the rule of law and diversity. Uh, I'd like to also thank our sponsors uh, for the LIDW, uh, in, and in particular, uh, they're all displayed on the screen, but in particular, FTI Consulting, our platinum sponsor. I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, to you our panellists uh, for today. Uh, firstly, ladies first, uh, Sarah Vasani, uh, heads Adelshaw Goddard's Investor State Dispute Resolution Practice. Uh, Sarah is a skilled international arbitration lawyer specializing in both international commercial arbitration and investor state disputes representing both investor and state. Next, uh, Ian Quirk, Queen's Counsel. Uh, Ian is at Essex Court Chambers and has a, has a diverse practice covering a broad range of commercial law in both court, arbitration and offshore jurisdictions. He is the deputy chair of the ICC UK Arbitration Committee and UK delegate to the ICC Global Arbitration Commission. Thirdly and finally, Colin Yu. Uh, Colin is a member of Duxton Hill Chambers Singapore and has acted in a wide range of disputes before the Singaporean courts, as well as in international arbitration. Uh, he is the author of a leading work on legal professional privilege in Singapore. Uh, all of our panelists are uh, also sitting as arbitrator. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to kick off uh, and invite uh, Ian to, to tell us a little bit about Enker and Chubb. What did it decide? Why is it important? And where does it stand in the, in the ranking of great decisions uh, from our Supreme Court? Sure, yeah. sure, I'll try. Hi, everyone. Um, so Enker and Chubb was a decision of the Supreme Court in October of last year. And it settled or supposedly settled a raging debate as to what law governs an arbitration agreement. And that was a, a ding dong that was between the lawyers only, inevitably. Uh, the clients, obviously, and quite rightly, had no interest in it at all. But we are lawyers. Uh, we like a good dose of navel gazing. And so here we go. Um, why is the law, first of all, of the arbitration agreement important? Well, it's because it determines what disputes fall within the arbitration agreement and therefore what disputes the tribunal has jurisdiction over. It also determines whether the arbitration agreement is a valid agreement. In ENCA, whether the arbitration agreement was governed by Russian or English law was important because English law was said to take a wider interpretation of the arbitration agreement and so that why was, that's why it became such a big issue in that case. I'm just going to deal with the key facts first of all and this really is the key facts and I'll do it very briefly. The appellant Chubb was a Russian insurance company which had insured the owner of a power plant against damage by fire. The respondent Turkish company Enka had been a contractor involved in the construction of the plant. The important point for our purposes is that the construction contract did not contain a governing choice of law clause, but it provided for disputes to be referred to English arbitration under the ICC rules. The plant was destroyed by fire and Chubb paid out under the policy and began Russian proceedings against Enka and others. Enka understandably took issue with that, given the arbitration clause, and Enka argued that the dispute fell within the arbitration agreement, 
and began English arbitration proceedings. A first instance English judge refused Enka's application for an anti-suit injunction to restrain the Russian proceedings. In the Court of Appeal, the court held that English law governed the arbitration agreement and granted an anti-suit injunction restraining Enka from continuing the Russian proceedings. So the central issue in the Supreme Court was which system of national law governs the validity and scope of the arbitration agreement when the law applicable to the contract differs from the law of the seat of the arbitration. And the parties accepted, although for different reasons, that the main contract was governed by Russian law. So what this really was, was a debate between what was known as the main contract approach and the seat approach. In other words, should the proper law of the arbitration agreement be the law of the main contract in which the arbitration agreement is contained, or should it be the law of the seat of the arbitration? And there were directly conflicting Court of Appeal decisions on this. So it really was quite exciting if, um, if that is your thing. To those who couldn't face reading the judgment, all 110 pages of it, or have tuned into this session because you expect me to tell you, which is fair enough, I won't hold you in suspense and I'll give you the result first. There was a split Supreme Court, um, each of the two camps giving very, very full judgment, 60 pages for the majority, 50 pages for the minority. And the result in the Supreme Court was what I, what I call rule one and rule two. Rule one is this, that where the law applicable to the arbitration agreement is not specified, and that will be in 99% of cases because no lawyer, unless they were an arbitration geek, thought to specify a law in the arbitration clause itself, as opposed to the wider contract. So where the law applicable to the arbitration agreement is not specified, then a choice of governing law for the contract as a whole will generally apply to the arbitration agreement. And that's because it forms part of the contract. It's really as simple as that. Now, given the time and expense, no doubt, spent on Inca, that feels like a bit of an anticlimax. And indeed, it's probably the answer that any Joe or Joanne on the street would have given. If the contract specifies a governing law, surely it would apply to the arbitration clause in the contract as well. And to some extent, it is an anticlimax, uh, but I'll come in a moment to discuss whether, in fact, this was uh, a seismic change or a seismic moment in arbitration law. That's rule one. Rule two is that in the absence of any choice of governing law for the contract, so there's no governing law in, clause in the contract at all, and no implied choice of governing law for the contract. I'll come back to that point. Then, if the parties have chosen a seat of arbitration, then the law of the arbitration agreement will be the same as the seat. Okay, so that's rule two. And that's because the system of law that the arbitration agreement has its closest connection to is, uh, says the, court, the, the Supreme Court, the law of the seat. And that can lead to the position where the law of the arbitration agreement differs from the law applicable to the party's substantive contractual obligations. But there's no issue with that. As a result, the appeal was dismissed in Enka. The, the contracts of the court contain no choice of law to govern the uh, arbitration agreement uh, or the contract, uh, and that therefore the arbitration agreement was governed by the law of the seat. And so the law applicable to the arbitration agreement was English law and the anti-suit injunction stood. Okay, so that's the case. Now, the topic for today is the significance of these decisions and their impacts on London as an arbitration centre. So, so what, what, what is the significance of this decision? Well, first of all, it does, at least for many cases, put to bed the debate about how you determine the law of the arbitration agreement. And that was not just a debate in this country, but it was, it was in others too, and it continues to rage um, in some other countries. Secondly, 
whilst there was a dissenting minority judgment, uh, which was to adopt the Andrex toilet paper advert strong and equally long, in fact, once you've waded through that minority judgment, the legal analysis is, despite first appearances, not very much different to the majority. The difference was largely a factual one. The, the minority considered that there had, in fact, been a choice of Russian law for the main contract. They said it was an, imp sorry, that's, this is a minority view, that there had been an implied choice. And hence, that's what applied to the arbitration agreement under rule one. And the majority had said, uh, the parties had not agreed on what the law was, so there was no choice. And that really is what the 50 page minority judgment boils down to. So in that sense, this was a strong and consistent decision on the legal principles from five Supreme Court judges. Now, whether it's helpful to have a minority judgment at all, as opposed to the judges producing a single opinion, and whether a 110 page judgment helps or hinders a clear exposition of the law for the benefit of practitioners and users is thankfully beyond today's topic, unless of course, someone asks a question. But the third, the third point of significance of this decision uh, is that the result that the governing law clause applies to the arbitration agreement is the natural and sensible result, which would, I suspect, be the answer that any reasonably interested bystander, if you could find such a person, would give if they were asked. And the debate really only raged because arbitration lawyers are obsessed, and we really are obsessed, with the separability of the arbitration agreement. Indeed, without that concept, it's difficult to see what we would have talked about at all um, at those conferences over the years. But on this point, we can perhaps speak later about whether separability justified the seat approach at all, because I have my doubts. But to anyone drafting the contract, and certainly to lay people, the suggestion in, that a clause in the contract would not be governed by the law specified in the contract would not only be counterintuitive, but bizarre. And so the, the Supreme Court has hit the nail on the head with a decision which reflects the reality and the experience of commercial parties. So just very briefly, what might be wrong with it? Well, first of all, inevitably, it means that the law of the arbitration agreement and the law of the seat might be different. So the English court might have to apply a foreign law to determine the jurisdiction of the tribunal. But there's generally no issue with that uh, and no difficulty in the English court in doing so. The, the second point of, of potential um, uh, uh, issue with the case is a lack of clarity over when there will have been an implied choice of the governing uh, law of the main contract. Uh, and there was a difference of view between the majority decision and the minority one. Of those two, um, the, the minority said that there had been a clear implied choice of Russian law. And indeed the facts to me uh, um, tend to support very much what uh, the minority say. Uh, so if for my money, the minority had it right, um, uh, and indeed the majority's point, which was that this was a detailed drafted contract by lawyers. It didn't have a governing law clause. And so that must mean the parties couldn't have agreed uh, on uh, and made no choice about the governing law. Doesn't seem to me to work because if that was right, then in every such uh, contract, the answer would be uh, it was because they couldn't agree. So having said all of that, that point though is unlikely to cause difficulty in practice because it makes no difference to the legal principle. And in the vast majority of cases uh, of detailed lawyer drafted contracts, there will of course be a governing law clause. So for now, I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian, thank you for that. Uh, great exposition on, on anchor in 12 minutes, just as I had asked you to do. Marvellous, you're on time as well. Uh, we're going to turn to, uh, to Halliburton now, uh, and Sarah is going to tell us a bit about uh, that decision, and again, its significance and where it ranks uh, in 
the top 20 Supreme Court decisions in the arbitration world. Thanks very much, Peter. Uh, similar to Ian, I'll start by giving a factual overview of Halliburton, uh, both for the benefit of those who have not yet read it, and also because it's a very fact-specific uh, determination that was made in this case. And then I'll focus on the good, the bad, and the ugly of Halliburton. So as much of our audience will already know, um, Halliburton and Chubb involved claims that arose out of the Deepwater Horizon accident, which caused extensive damage loss of life and led to a number of claims before the US courts. So in 2014, a federal court apportioned liability between all the parties and following that, Halliburton settled its civil law claims in the US and it paid out civil liabilities. Now Halliburton in turn then claimed back those amounts from Chubb against an insurance uh, policy. But Chubb rejected those claims on the basis that the settlement wasn't a reasonable settlement. So that led Halliburton to commence arbitration under the Bermuda Forum policy that was in question, which was governed by New York law, but seated in London and called for arbitration by a three member uh, panel. Now, both of the parties nominated their own uh, party appointed arbitrators, but those party, arbitrated, uh, party appointed arbitrators were not able to agree on a chair. And accordingly, the high court appointed Ken Rokeson QC, who had been one of Chubb's candidates and to whom uh, Halliburton objected as the chair in the arbitration. Now, I'd just like to underscore here that Mr. Rokeson was therefore injected into the chair position by the court over the objections of Halliburton. Now, given that, um, it would be my submission uh, that from that moment onwards, uh, Mr. Rokeson would, have expect, would be expected um, to have acted with scrupulous integrity vis-a-vis -vis Halliburton. But yet six months later, Mr. Rokeson accepted a party appointed uh, appointment by Chubb, which dealt with the same uh, uh, set of same similar set of facts um, and with the same instructing solicitors. And this dispute, uh, again, same incident and involved the same question, which again was the reasonableness of the settlement. And if that wasn't enough, Mr. Rokeson then accepted a third appointment uh, as arbitrator that again arose out of the deep uh, water uh, horizon accident. Now this all was done without Halliburton's notice. Mr. Rokeson didn't disclose these two subsequent appointments to Halliburton. And after discovering his appointment in these two cases, Halliburton applied to the court to remove him under section 24 of the Arbitration Act. Um, so and at the lower court level, the court refused the application and, and Halliburton then appealed to the Court of Appeals which concluded that while Rokeson did have and should have disclosed his multiple appointments, an objective observer wouldn't have concluded that there was a real possibility that he was biased. Uh, so accordingly, the Court of Appeals dismissed the appeal and Halliburton then again appealed to the Supreme Court. Now, importantly, I think in this case, there were a number of arbitral institutions that uh, intervened in the proceedings, given its importance for the arbitration community. This included the LCIA, the ICC, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, the LMAA, and GAFTA. So we had a lot of um, different arbitral institutions that were uh, front and center in these proceedings. Uh, so moving on to what I think is the good of the case, um, you know, I'd like to focus on um, oh, and before I do that, I would actually note that although I'm a solicitor advocate and I'm qualified in the UK, uh, I don't spend, uh, unlike Ian and Peter, I don't spend any time doing uh, English litigation and I've never appeared before the English courts. So I've spent most of my career outside of England and Wales, and my practice fo focuses exclusively on commercial and investor state arbitration. So I'm very much uh, playing the role or putting on the hat of the audience that's listening uh, that is outside the United Kingdom, but that practices or is interested in international arbitration and whose clients often use English law uh, and London as their seat of arbitration. So there are two, really two parts uh, of the court's decision I'd like to focus on. And first, as I said, is the good. And that is that the Supreme Court affirmed the Court of Appeals finding that disclosure is a legal duty under English law. Um, and, and the court stated, and I'll just uh, read the language, Quote, a disclosure should be given of facts and circumstances known to the arbitrator, which in the language of section 24 of the act would or might give rise to justifiable doubts as to his impartiality. The court continued, under English law, this means 
facts or circumstances which would or might lead the fair-minded and informed observer, having considered the facts, to conclude that there was a real possibility that the arbitrator was biased. Now, the reason that the Supreme Court was required to spell this out is because Chubb, rather incredibly in my view, had argued that there was no duty of disclosure under English law on the part of the arbitrators. So none at all, no duty to disclose. There was only a duty of fairness and impartiality under section 33. This argument was very uh, you know, heavily opposed by the LCIA, the ICC and the Chartered Institute, and ultimately was rejected by the Supreme Court, which found that the duty of disclosure was part of the arbitrator's duty to act fairly and impartially under section 33. So in confirming this, the, the court essentially adopted the civil law formulation that came from Professor Peter Sanders in 1974 in a meeting that predated the 1976 Unsatral Rules. And that formulation has been wildly successful and has been adopted by most arbitral institutions, including the LCIA and the ICC. So in adopting that formula, the Supreme Court is telling us that an arbitrator must disclose anything that might, and I emphasize the word might, give rise to justifiable doubts. So the test under English law is when in doubt, disclose. And for me, that's the correct test. And that is the good aspect of the court's decision. Um, and obviously, you know, from the standpoint in our discussion is, is this good or bad for, for London as a seat? I think it was very helpful that the court made a clear finding that there is a legal duty to disclose under English law uh, and that it wasn't simply a matter of best practices as Chubb had argued. I think that's a step forward uh, and it does mean that we're now in step with international practices. And a court, the court again made very clear uh, that the duty of disclosure remains throughout the arbitration. So it's a continuing a duty. Again, I think we all would have thought that that was obvious, but it was helpful that the court reiterated it. Um, having gone from the good, let's now look at the bad, or at least the far more controversial. I think Ian might take a different approach on whether or not this is bad, I'm not sure yet. Um, and that really relates to the time of the assessment uh, of the need for disclosure. So here the court found that in assessing whether there's a real possibility that an arbitrator is biased, a fair-minded and informed observer must have regard to the facts and circumstances known at the time of a hearing to remove the arbitrator. I mean, for me, this is a completely uh, arbitrary point, uh, point in time. I think that most people in international arbitration uh, would feel that the failure to make a material disclosure should be determined at the time of the failure because it's a certain date. It's when the arbitrator knew, or at least at the very latest at the time of the objection. So with all due respect to the Supreme Court, its rationale on that point, I found rather flimsy and it was largely based on the fact that the relevant provision of the act uses the term exist in the present tense. So it was saying that we should you know, analyze this at the time of the removal hearing at present. Um, and for me, this is really peculiar because hindsight should not be relevant. Um, you know, at the point of the later appointments, the arbitrator could not possibly have guaranteed Halliburton that he would never be infected with the knowledge from the other arbitrations. Um, so I think, you know, once the breach of the duty to disclose was established, there should be a presumption of apparent bias, which should mean that the burden of proof should then switch to the arbitrator to demonstrate that he or she is not biased. And I think in practice, very few arbitrators would take, uh, take uh, that challenge upon themselves to argue for their uh, impartiality because they don't, you know, that very well might make them look even more biased. Um, so that was the issue of timing and the presumption, which I found to be rather bad. Um, and now, am I doing okay on time, Peter? Um, what, really, what really struck me, okay, two minutes, uh, and, and what I found ugly about the decision is how the Supreme Court essentially let Ken Rockison off the hook. Um, for me, this was a deeply unsatisfying result. It seemed to send out the message that although there's a legal duty, although that duty was breached, Notwithstanding that, the arbitrator uh, was somehow untouchable. And a lot of that was inferred about his reputation. He was a well-known, well-regarded arbitrator in the community. And for me, and I think for those looking out, you know, from the outside and looking into England, that would somehow uh, demonstrate that there's this, you know, 
club of arbitrators, perhaps a, you know, incestuous club of arbitrators that are you know, beyond the pale and they can do what they want and act how they wish. And so for me, the end result um, of, of you know, essentially finding that he had a duty, that he breached his duty, but yet that he could remain was an ugly result. Um, and I'll just touch quickly, P Peter, on the fact that in the Newcastle case, which was the first case to apply Halliburton, the same was found uh, to have happened in the sense that there was a duty to disclose. Uh, the arbitrator in that case should have disclosed his previous uh, interactions with both counsel and the party and the previous advice he had given. But yet, at the end of the day, the uh, court held that he uh, you know, would not be removed. So that, for me, is uh, somewhat... Um, diffi the difficulty of this case. And I think the finding, uh, what it sends, I think, to the outside world is that it's very difficult to remove an arbitrator no matter what he fails to disclose, which I think is harmful for London. But I, with that, I will turn it back to Peter. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and thank you also for touching on, on Newcastle. Uh, we had had a prior question about that. Um, and it was, um, uh, again, a, a very difficult case, a well-regarded uh, arbitrator Michael Belloff, um, who was sitting with uh, Lords Newberger and Dyson. So it was a very impressive panel, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the chair, Mr. Belloff, um, was not removed. And he also had engaged in ex parte communications with one party only. Um, uh, Colin, you're, you're sitting in, in Singapore. Uh, you have an outside view of our, our parochial London problems, perhaps. Uh, but it, there's perhaps no better time also to, to, to get the view from Singapore uh, with the news that uh, Singapore is now uh, equal favourite uh, global seat with London. So it has uh, all the standing, if you like, to, uh, to, to comment on how we're doing over here. What, what do you make of, of both of those cases? Thank you very much, Peter. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so what I'd like to, to do is, is maybe just give a, an out line or overview of, of where Singapore law stands on, on these two um, interesting issues, first of all, before I, I talk about the um, Anchor and Halliburton cases them, themselves. So I, I just want to highlight, first of all, that these issues, although they've been examined um, by the High Court in Singapore, they have not yet been definitively ruled upon by the Court of Appeal, which is our highest court. So although we do have a legal position, uh, that of course is subject to change if the Court of Appeal takes a different view um, in a dispute that reaches it. So on, on the issue of the governing law of the arbitration agreement, uh, the leading case on this is a case called DCY, which uh, I, I argued. Um, and the position that was taken is, is it was basically the Sul America position. Um, which is that if there is an express governing law clause in the main contract, that will be regarded as the proper law of the arbitration agreement, uh, unless for some reason the choice of that law might invalidate the arbitration agreement or otherwise do violence to the party's intention to arbitrate. Um, the, the difference between this case, the DCY case, uh, and the anchor case is that in BCY, there was an express choice of the governing law of the contract. Uh, and that, as Ian said, will be the vast majority of cases. So Anchor really comes into its own in that very small minority class of cases where there isn't an express choice of governing law for the main contract. Um, and for some reason, there also isn't an implied choice of governing law, uh, which with respect to the majority, I, I think will, will also be rare. Um, and, and therefore the court is left to infer and in sort of uh, on the basis of the closest and real, real connection test, uh, the governing law of the main contract uh, and, and, and the finding that that is different from the law of the, of the seat. Uh, that situation hasn't arisen in Singapore. So, so it's still um, an open question whether or not we will follow uh, the majority or the minority in Anchor if that situation were to arise. But like I said, I, I do think that that probably will be quite a small class of cases. Um, and as Ian said, uh, really only the lawyers uh, 
probably have the best uh, or the, the most interesting fighting over that. Um, what I did want to talk about in a little, little bit more detail is how Singapore approaches the, the Halliburton type question. Uh, again, that's something that has been fairly recently examined um, in two cases. And the important distinction, I think, between those two cases and Halliburton and Newcastle is, is this that the challenge to the arbitrator only arose after the handing down of the adjudication determination in the first case and the award in, in the second case, revealing that the decision had gone against the person bringing the challenge. So right from the outset, it looks like a tactical challenge, um, which of course wasn't the case in Halliburton and Newcastle because there had been a substantive decision one way or the other yet. And, and it is perhaps that that, has, that influenced the, the Singapore courts in, in the reasoning that they have adopted, which is similar uh, to, to Halliburton, um, but drew from mainly Australian jurisprudence on this question. And so the, the approach that Singapore takes on this is that it is not the association per se between the arbitrator and, and, and one of the parties. It is the capacity of that association to influence the decision of the arbitrator rather than the association itself. And so you've got to show some sort of rational connection between the association and the prospect of bias. And you might be able to do that by, uh, by, by way of demonstrating the duration or the intensity or the nature of that association, uh, the, the time which has passed since the last renewal of that association, you might also be able to do, uh, uh, sorry, and, and in common with Halliburton, I think it was accepted that the failure to fully disclose the association might be one factor, which might lead to the inference of bias, but only if there are other circumstances objectively which support the finding of bias. Uh, and so what will then become quite important is the nature of uh, any partial disclosure or, or non-disclosure that was, that was made by the arbitrator or, or not made, and whether that gives rise to an impression that the arbitrator was deliberately suppressing uh, information which might lead to a challenge or was somehow misleading in the disclosure that was given. Um, emphasis was also placed on the, the detail, the speed and the tone of the tribunals or the arbitrator's response to requests for uh, detailed disclosure and whether that might manifest um, an indication as to uh, the prospect of bias. Um, so just commenting then on, on the Halliburton case uh, itself, I think Sarah was absolutely right in that as far as the duty of disclosure is concerned, the existence of that duty, um, that's probably something that's not going to be controversial in the majority of model law jurisdictions because the model law provides for duty of disclosure. And so what is more interesting is the content of that disclosure. Um, and I think the Supreme Court was clear that there are certain types of association, those that would give rise to justifiable doubts as to the arbitrator's impartiality or independence, which cannot be remedied by disclosure. And so we're really talking about uh, disclosure of circumstances which might give rise to justifiable doubts if, if there was no disclosure. Um, and, and so if that's the case, then I do wonder whether it was right for the Supreme Court to say that as a general rule, the arbitrator is not expected or obliged to search for facts and circumstances uh, to, to disclose because um, that then gives something of a free pass, I think, to situations in Halliburton or, or Newcastle where the arbitrator apparently just forgot uh, or overlooked the facts and circumstances that might have um, uh, been a problem. And, and I think there is real force in Lady Arden's uh, reference to um, director's duties to disclose conflicts of interest and whether that, uh, whether they should be giving, uh, I beg pardon, that they should, disclose matters of which they ought reasonably to be aware. Uh, and I think that's really something that, um, a duty that should apply to arbitrators as well. Uh, just picking up 
on Sarah's point, though, as to whether it really is all that controversial for the assessment of bias to take place at the hearing rather than at the time of disclosure. Uh, I think the Singaporean cases that I mentioned um, might be relevant because if you've got a challenge that looks tactical in the sense that there's been a very fair award, it's been even-handed, uh, one side has won some, one side has, has, has won uh, other points, why, why shouldn't you take that in, into account um, in determining whether or not the arbitrator failed to give disclosure might reasonably be said to be biased? Um, and, and I had a challenge very recently on, on just those types of grounds. It was a, a, a you know, detailed, um, gargantuan award that was obviously very carefully, very diligently done. Um, the, the, the winning part, the ultimately winning party didn't win on all points. It, it lost a substantial number of points. Um, and if the argument is made that you really only assess the question of bias at the time disclosure ought to have been made, um, then, then I, I think in some cases, or perhaps in the majority of cases where these tactical challenges are brought, you, you will have a problem because um, you won't have reference to anything that goes on uh, in the hearing or in the award, which is the best way for the arbitrator to demonstrate that he isn't biased. Uh, but I think we can talk more about that uh, in the question and answer session. Um, with that, Peter, I'm just going to rest there so that we've got enough time to talk about some of the slightly meatier points that will come out of all of this. Uh, and I do look forward to the question and answer session. Colin, thank you for that. Um, um, it, it may, just on that last point before we, we forget it, uh, why forget it, perhaps more importantly, uh, it may be that justice has to be seen to be done as well as being done. Um, and th that may be the answer to your point. Uh, but I wanted now to to go back to to um, Enka uh, and, and just discuss a few points coming out of that. I think we all probably want to spend a bit more time on Halliburton than on Enka. But but Ian, you you, you touched on the point of separability, and um, that's at the heart of the decision. If if you, as the Supreme Court, restrict separability to the Section Seven sense and don't have a wider view of separability that it creates a completely freestanding contract um, th then you start from an entirely different position in the in the logic don't you but um <clears throat> as, I, you? I, you know, as, I, as i mentioned earlier i you know we, we arbitration lawyers are the only people that find separability exciting um, we we invented it and we invented it for a single practical aim which is that if the contract is arguably void for whatever reason, the arbitration agreement is not, so that there can still be arbitration over the dispute. And that's what Section 7 of the Arbitration Act reflects. So arbitrability, sorry, separability is this artificial construct to meet that aim. And it shouldn't be a, a, a tail which is allowed to wag the dog in all sorts of other um, different contexts. My, my view is that the, court of, the Supreme Court's decision is, is practical and reflects in 99% of cases the reality, um, which is where the parties have specified a law for the contract, they usually intend that to apply to the contract as a, as a whole. Um, and so, so I, I think that the, the Supreme Court's reversal of the Court of Appeal about this was, was positive and it reflects well on London as an arbitration centre. Um, and I think reflects what the users of arbitration intend. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't buy the argument, which I know has been made in some quarters, which is that this is all inconsistent with, with the argument about separability. Separability should be uh, on a plane, godlike plane, uh, and is untouchable. That's not how separability um, is, is meant to operate. It is, it, it is artificially created by arbitration lawyers to serve a single purpose. Thank you for that. We've got a few questions from the audience, so I'm going to surprise my panellists with a few of those and let's see who wants to take the bad anchor. Let's do a few of those quickly. Uh, what if both no choice of law and no choice of seat, what do we then do? Anyone yeah, want to jump in on that one? Well, I'll, I'll give you my thought while you all think, no, go on in. Well, I was going to say, well, then, then you are, of course, stuck. You, um, this decision does not, does not 
help you. Um, if, if there is no choice of, of, um, of seat and there's no choice of, of, of contract the, uh, law, um, you, you have to work out what your starting point is, um, which is either whether you work out whether there's an implied uh, choice of the con of the law governing the contract and take that as your starting point, or, or you work out what the law of the seat is uh, based on um, other case law about, about that. But, the di but depending on which you take as your starting point can lead you to a different conclusion. Uh, yeah, I, uh, unless anybody else wants to, I, I would say you deal with the seat first under section three of the act and um, uh, and then, then it all follows from there, but um, that would be my view. Uh, another one uh, from, that was from Christopher Moja, this one from James Clanchy, um, uh, just highlighting perhaps a gap in the ICC rules. Uh, the LCIA rules have a default choice of the law of the arbitration agreement, uh, as do the LMAA terms. Um, so that feels a bit uh, in there, or you could be in Scotland or Sweden, whose um, arbitration and statutes also provide um, for, for default choice. Um, well, that I think raises another question, Peter, and that is, as arbitration lawyers, should we be counseling now our clients to specify in contracts the choice of governing law for the arbitration agreement? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, I think, personally, I think we should. I'm pleased to say I've been doing it for, yeah. for some years. Um, I'm not sure my, my corporate colleagues have been listening to me, but I have been telling them uh, to to expressly choose a, a law of the arbitration agreement, but um, I, uh, it, and I think Ian, you know, you make a good point in that I think a lot of commercial parties do think the choice of the governing law will apply to everything. Uh, but I also have a lot of clients that you know, uh, especially if they were previous dispute lawyers, who think, where is the arbitration going to be? Where am I going to? What happens? And where will I be if I've I've got a dispute? And they would hope that the arbitration clause was governed by by that provision as well. So I think it really depends on uh, the, the client in question. And I think it's always safer than than to be sorry and, and to specify this. Yeah, I mean that that was always the argument on the other side, uh, which was <clears throat> surely the arbitration agreement has to be interpreted using the same law as the seat. But the Supreme Court says uh, that doesn't follow at all because it's perfectly normal. Um, that and and perfectly possible for the let's say the English court as the court of the sea to interpret uh, the arbitration agreement according to the proper law of the arbitration agreement and if that's French law or German law there's no issue with that and it, it is inevitable that if you've got a contract which has a seat which is different to the law of the contract it is inevitable that at some point there, there is going to be one court, if it gets to court, that has to consider two laws. Uh, so as soon as you introduce two different legal systems into your contract, you are in that potential scenario. But, but there's just no issue with that. Perfectly normal for the courts to deal with a foreign law and apply it here in the context of jurisdiction. Colin, were you going to come in? I no. I, I was. I was just going to say that, and I think probably from from a, a practical point of view, um, perhaps the, the most important point to come out of, of ENCA is, is that um, it is now really, really important to expressly specify the governing law of the main contract. And the arbitration clause, if you want to make it different. If, if, um, if you wanted to, but I, I think um, I agree with Ian that uh, apart from the arbitration lawyers, nobody ever, nobody ever thinks or cares about that. It, that's a sacrilege, but there we go. <laughs> part of the model clause now in the LCIA. Uh, you know, I guess James was saying that that's already the default rule, but it, for, for institutions where it's not, certainly uh, removing that element of uh, surprise and potential uh, litigation is a good thing. Well, um, that, I mean, there we've got a few more questions on ENCA. Um, I, I want to make sure we've got proper time for, for Halliburton. Um, so, so let's switch. Uh, now smoothly onto to Halliburton. And um, I'd like to kick off the discussion with, uh, of course, Halliburton concerned the Bermuda form and ad hoc arbitration, no institutional rules. Um, that's a relatively rare um, circumstance in, in what we have to deal with in our day jobs, most of us. Most of us have institutional rules. 
Uh, would this have got to this stage had we had the LCIA or the ICC? I don't think so. Um, I think he never would have gotten through uh, if this was an institutional arbitration. It was really the peculiar fact that it was an ad hoc arbitration that allowed this to go through. And I think that's why you had the LCIA, the ICC, and, and the Chartered Institute you know, advocating that uh, there should be uh, a test that he should have disclosed and that there very much as a legal duty. Um, you know, all of those rules, uh, if you're sitting as arbitrator in any of those institutions, you're going to be making uh, inquiries initially into whether or not there are any conflicts, you'll be disclosing everything. Um, and, and really, you know, there's always a, a strong preference for disclosure in all of those institutions. So I don't think he would have had the same result uh, had this been an institutional arbitration. Do we, do we have consensus on that point? Ian, Colin? Uh, I mean, I don't think you can exclude... Ian, you're, you're an ICC man, come on. What, yeah, what, I, mean, I mean, I don't think... The ICC, they, they, they submitted in the Supreme Court yeah, that, yeah. Um, that the fact of non-disclosure, uh, as did all of the institutions, the, the three, uh, ICC, ILCIA and CIL, uh, all submitted, that the mere fact of non-disclosure could itself be sufficient to disqualify. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the Supreme Court doesn't disagree with that point in the sense that um, the, the mere fact of non-disclosure can um, amount to apparent bias, but it will be only in particular circumstances, likely to be um, extreme circumstances where that would arise. And the reason why they said that was because both the Halliburton decision and the Newcastle decision were concerned with inadvertent non-disclosures. And in both cases, um, that, was, that was common ground. There, there wasn't any challenge to the fact that these were inadvertent. Um, in, in Halliburton, it was, expressly, it was expressly no challenge to that. It was expressly agreed. And in, um, in, in Newcastle, um, nobody was saying, well, we don't accept that this was inadvertent. Now, once, once you're in the inadvertent territory, then the question is, is it right that someone who inadvertently doesn't disclose something should be removed as arbitrator? And my view is that, um, that, that it wouldn't be right to do that. It would, it would be a massive overreaction uh, to remove someone because they have made an inadvertent disclosure. To, an inadvertent could mean a variety of things. Inadvertent could be um, that there has been an administrative error in, in the form which is put together, the form that's sent to the ICC in it by some administrative reason has failed to include one, one element. Um, is it right that someone could be removed as arbitrator because of that kind of inadvertent disclosure, even though it be a breach of the duty? Of course not. Um, moving up the list, you then have the, the situations in Halliburton and Newcastle where um, uh, there were inadvertent, basically they forgot or, or inadvertently um, didn't disclose. Um, again, does that mean that those arbitrators um, have, have given an appearance of bias? That's what we're concerned with here. The duty of disclosure is all about, and the, and the reason for it, and the reason it's wider than the apparent bias test is because it is to allow people to check that the apparent bias test is being complied with effectively but you remove people when there is apparent bias. You don't remove people in situations which are not situations of apparent bias, such as administrative error. So um, in, in my view, although I, I, I undoubtedly, I think I see the ICC would have taken a different, would have, uh, have, have, um, have removed um, the, the arbitrator in both cases. Um, I don't think the court is, is wrong about this. Where, we're dealing, where you're dealing with inadvertent breaches, I think we do have to be careful not to um, get overexcited in the sense that any uh, inadvertent breach gives rise to apparent bias or a presumption of bias. I think that's quite dangerous. I think the test should remain uh, that if there's been an inadvertent breach, does that mean that what has not been disclosed was uh, was circumstances that gave rise to apparent bias. If yes, remove. If no, don't. Ian, I'm not sure we can say that there was an inadvertent um, 
you know, he, there was a, he forgot to disclose. And certainly in the case of Rokasin, he did think about it. He put his, it says he put his mind to it mm, and he decided absolutely. not to disclose. And how could you forget after being, you know, injected into the chair position over the objection of a party, then six months later to take another appointment as party appointed arbitrator for the uh, party whose list you were on and who uh, was contrary to the person you were objecting to. I mean, to me, that's unfathomable. I, you just, how could he have forgotten? He, he didn't, he thought about it and he thought it wasn't necessary. And I think if that's the stand, I mean, I, I think what bothers me so much about uh, Halliburton and Newcastle is I think the, the facts are so egregious that any, re I mean, I, I would hope that most of us in the international arbitration community, in international arbitration community would have certainly disclose these facts. They were absolutely um, worthy of disclosure. And, and I think they should have known better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree they should have been disclosed. Um, but, the, but the question is then, what is the, what is the sanction for that? Sh is the sanction for not disclosing something which wouldn't otherwise be a, apparent bias, which wouldn't otherwise be disclosure of a fact of apparent bias, is the sanction for that removal um, and, and my view is that it's not. It might it, that they and the, what the court said was, well, in that case, you're allowing or or, or, or dealt with this argument and, and criticisms are being made about it. In that case, you're allowing these arbitrators to not disclose. Yes, what they what they didn't disclose might not have justified their removal, but they sh they should have disclosed it nevertheless. Um, um, you're allowing them to not disclose without sanction, and the court says. Well, it's not without sanction, sanction because it might be that those arbitrators have to pay the costs of failed challenges. Um, it's um, that they're still in breach of their duty of disclosure, which is a contractual duty, which is owed to the parties and those contractual um, uh, co consequences that follow. And the qu question is whether those sanctions are sufficient, and that is a genuine question, or whether you need to, in relation to all breach, effectively all breaches of the uh, duty to disclose, you need to say tough removal. Well, I'm going to bring Colin in here, but Colin, perhaps you can um, help us also on, on what is apparent bias, isn't it? Uh, the lack of demonstrable independence uh, and justice must be seen to be done. And if you if you follow those two themes, don't don't you get to a different point, or do you get to a different point? Um, so on, on that last point, um, you know, I think the question is how exactly uh, or what evidence do you take into account when assessing whether or not justice has been, has been seen to be, to be done? Because in, in a very real sense, the uh, award is the only means through which the arbitrators um, can, can speak and, and can demonstrate um, their even-handedness or, or impartiality. And, and so if you take that view, then uh, if there is an award, I would have thought that that's probably the best evidence you've got of whether or not there is demonstrable um, impartiality or independence. But what I think is, is perhaps um, uh, something that the Supreme Court might not have, have examined in as much detail as, as perhaps uh, could have been done is, is whether it is right as a matter of principle to elide um, the issue of impartiality and independence uh, and, and in a related vein, whether or not it is right to apply the exact same apparent bias test um, as is done in, uh, for, for judges uh, as, as to arbitrators. And I think the Supreme Court you know, highlighted a number of ways that arbitrators defer, uh, important ways um, in which arbitrators differ from, from judges. Uh, they sit in private, for instance. There is no ability, uh, certainly for, for one party in, uh, or, or the non-common party in common arbitrations to sit in a watching brief to understand what arguments were made or accepted by the arbitrator. Um, all of those points, I think, are, are good ones. And so I, I did wonder when I first read Halliburton whether there was scope for saying that uh, traditionally bias is the lack of uh, demonstrable uh, impartiality, uh, but that most of, of the rules on this sort of thing refer to impartiality or independence. And how this might make a real difference is take, take the Newcastle uh, case. Uh, 
uh, there might be absolutely no question whatsoever that Michael Belov was uh, impartial. Uh, and I don't think anybody would suggest otherwise. But in circumstances where he did have connections to one party, he had advised that party on, on the, the same contract, maybe not the same section of, of the rules, but certainly the same set of rules. Uh, he had engaged in ex-party communications with that party. Uh, couldn't we say that there were justifiable doubts as to his independence from that party? Uh, and if so, why, why isn't that sufficient grounds for, for removal, uh, leaving aside the issue of impartiality? That was my thoughts anyway. That's an interesting point, Colin, because the, the court, you know, went through 15 different reasons why arbitrators are different uh, than judges, but then yet it applied the same test. It didn't, you know, it said they're different, uh, but then we're going to apply the same test, which, you know, they went back to the Section 24 test as opposed to saying it's it's about, um, it, 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 they are different, let's let's judge them according to different standards. You're right, they, they, they justified it and then they did a, a volt face and, and went back to the same old test for judges. Yeah. And what about investor state tribunals, Sarah? I mean, that's that's your your bailiwick, as we would call it. Um, uh, how, how would they deal with the, the situation? Uh, well, I think I think you would have come to different results in, in an investor case. I mean, all of those are are very different. So um, you know, you have to take a case um, by the by its particular facts. But just to give you an example, um, you know, there's an exit case of Ruby Rose where an arbitrator called Brunner Bosch was, was Kazakhstan's appointee. And that case involved a certain set of facts and, and, and legal issues. And it was decided ultimately in favor of Kazakhstan. Um, and then there was a second arbitration, Kara Tube II, uh, where Mr. Um, Bruno Bosch was then appointed as Kazakhstan's party appointed um, arbitrator. There were overlapping facts, overlapping legal issues, overlapping witnesses. Um, and he was then challenged by the claimant uh, on the basis that he had, uh, among other things, information that the two other ones didn't have because they hadn't sat in the previous case. Um, and uh, the other, it's a different procedure, but the other two co-arbitrators had to decide the challenge. And they said, yes, absolutely. You know, there's, there's an information asymmetry here because he has been sitting in a previous case that had the same witnesses, same legal issues, same facts. And so, you know, he needs to be removed. So that was you know, one instance. Uh, uh, so I think uh, Mr. Rokeson wouldn't have made it, uh, wouldn't have received the same reception at ICSID. Uh, another example is uh, uh, the case of Iser versus Spain, where the annulment committee uh, in that ICSID case had held that the arbitrator's mere failure to disclose his relationship with Brattle Group, which is a, a damages um, uh, quantum expert expert that he had used when he was counsel for a number of appointments, uh, that failure to disclose in and of itself had denied Spain the opportunity to challenge him and therefore it denied him a fundamental rule of procedure. So in, in and of itself, the failure to disclose was disqualifying. Um, so the answer I think is they would have taken a very different approach and that type of behavior and conduct in terms of non-disclosure would not be allowed to stand. I just want to um, ask one uh, other question we've got from uh, on the Q and A, which is: Is it the same standard for uh, party appointed as for a chair? Um, yes. Is everyone saying yes to that? Yep. There we are. We've answered that question. Um, is it right that there should be um, different standards in whether it's commodity or, or uh, other shipping or whatever? Uh, that you can have repeat appointments, which is, 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 is that right, um, that we, we carve that out? I mean, this is a difficult one, I think. Because... Or gafter people here? <laughs> no, well, certainly not me, but um, again. I mean, obviously this Colin? is something that the, the court talks about a lot. Um, uh, LMAA, GAFTA, but also sports arbitrations, which is something that was um, an issue, an issue in the Newcastle case. There is a small, um, number of, of arbitrators who are qualified for those cases uh, and certainly in the so that's one point the second point is that in the LM, LMA and GAFTA type cases it is recognized and has long been recognized that that um, the same arbitrators are being instructed by the same parties same solicitors on repeat a repeat basis and the and the evidence from LMA and GAFTA was that that was part of the system that was the that was 
if you like, implied into the use of that kind of arbitration. And I think there has always been a difference between that kind of arbitration and what we call international arbitration in the sort of ICC, LCIA style. So- yeah, And uh, thanks, I'm, I'm gonna cut you off there um, because uh, we have a minute left. Uh, so I want to give you each two sentences uh, to, to answer the, the two questions. Uh, one, um, uh, which is the more important? And two, do they affect London's reputation as an arbitration centre? Uh, ladies first, uh, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to go with Halliburton being the more important decision. And yes, but it's complicated because I think there are good, uh, certain good aspects of the decision, but also ones, in, especially in regard to application, that I, I think are harmful. Ian? Uh, Halliburton also is the more important of the two decisions. Do I think it's harmful to, to, to London's reputation? No. Um, the, the legal test is, is a sound one, namely a wider obligation of disclosure and a more narrow and apparent bias test. Um, the application of it on the facts, in certain respects, I agree there are question marks over, but there's a factual applications of the test, which is sound. Colin? Um, I'm, I'm going to align myself with, with Ian. Um, uh, I think in common with, with uh, all the speakers, I agree that Halliburton uh, is the more important decision. Um, and and I, I don't think it has negatively impacted uh, London's uh, reputation uh, as, as an international arbitration centre. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, we are unanimous. Peter, I what's your agree. answer to that? I, I too agree that Halliburton is the more important. I do think it is affecting London's reputation, certainly on its application to the facts of various cases. I agree the broad test is right. Uh, but I think it needs to be nuanced. I think there needs to be a, a duty of inquiry uh, before the disclosure and, and various other things. I agree on the date issue and various other bits, but I think the broad principle is right. Um, and so my thanks to you, the audience, for logging on and watching. Uh, my apologies, we didn't get to all of your questions. Uh, I think we dealt with most of them, but not all of them. My thanks to the panel, um, uh, Ian, Sarah and Colin for their great contributions. Thanks again to our sponsors, in particular to our platinum sponsor, FBI Consulting. Uh, I hope you all stay safe, stay well, and uh, a virtual round of applause for our panelists. There we go. Thank you. Good Thanks day.